Good morning to the Hopeside Church and I'm really glad to be here. It's a privilege for me to be here. You know, I've been learning about this uh, church for a long time. My brother keeps sending all those links and I keep watching some of the programs that are happening here. And I count it as a great privilege to be here this morning. In fact, uh, incidentally, I understand that this church was started uh, on my birthday, September 3, a few years ago. And uh, you celebrated again, I think the third, is it the third inauguration? Your uh, fifth, fifth, fifth anniversary? Uh, I'm really glad that I could be here to participate in the Sabbath School lesson study. Now, this quarter's lesson is the most important lesson that every human being on earth must know. Because it gives the answer in such clear terms regarding sin and suffering. And that is what we are going to study this uh, morning. It talks about God and human suffering. Very, very important questions. In fact, uh, I can put it this way, is that every other religion on this planet Earth is an attempt to answer this question, God and suffering. And uh, as we move along, we will try to understand the real answer from the Word of God. I come from a country that has almost about more than three crore gods. And uh, they try to give an explanation to why suffering exists. At best, the only thing that they can say is, it is your fate. And uh, this morning, we are going to look at from the Word of God of uh, what's the meaning of suffering. Let's go to our text that is found in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter and verse 34. We all know this by heart. It says here, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Therefore, let's go to the Bible and look at the word that Jesus used, therefore. Now, whenever Jesus used therefore, that means it's a conclusion, isn't it? Jesus talks about many things and says, therefore, don't worry. Now let me ask you the question, what was it that Jesus is saying, the reason why we should not worry? In other words, Jesus is saying, because of this, don't worry. Therefore, don't worry. Uh, can you just read that text that is there, the previous verse, and give us the answer, why did Jesus say not to worry? Because the question that we are going to ask is that, how is it that we can face tomorrow without worry? In other words, if you're not thinking about tomorrow, would you, would you face it? Brother? If I was not thinking about tomorrow. Yeah, if you're not worrying about tomorrow, would you face it? Well, my alternative is not to face it. <laughs> not to face it? Uh, so I wouldn't take that. Yes. To not face it. Yep. I don't know what that would mean. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I will face tomorrow. And I don't know that I don't have to think about tomorrow. Okay. I should, I should plan for care. Uh, that's, that's, that'll allow me to face tomorrow. Yeah, that, that's the ideal thing. Let's say you bought a ticket to go to India. Uh, don't you want to know whether it is confirmed, uh, whether the, the flights are there? And aren't you going to think about it and worry about it? What Jesus is saying, is it a practical suggestion? I'm focusing on the word work <laughs> more more than yeah facing tomorrow. I think I think it's the word work stands out to me. Okay. So I'm just saying uh, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Yeah. Um, perhaps trust in him. Okay. A little bit more. Yes. And and one thing is certain in, in, in all of this yeah, in, the, in the last he says. Tomorrow has its struggles. I'm sorry, tomorrow has its struggles. So, mm -hmm. so one thing is 
serving every day for his challenges. Yes. He doesn't say that everything's going to be all right. Okay. He says, just don't worry, have faith in me. Mm -hmm. There will be challenges tomorrow, and yeah. there will be challenges today. That's life. That is true. In other words, when you look at the word tomorrow, what principle does Jesus give us in this word so that we can have confidence that each day that we can face them? That word tells us, therefore. What is that therefore? The previous verses, if you see from 30 onwards. Yeah. Please do not worry. That's, yeah. I don't know what you are translating. Yes. But my focus is do not worry. Why? Okay, I'll tell you. Yes. You go to the Bible. Yeah. You have this word, do not worry. Yes. In the Old Testament as in the New Testament. Yes. Every writer yes. that he does are uh, every thing that's coming up. Yes. He tells the people very prophecy. Yes. Okay. Yes. So do not worry. Yes. That's the main thing. Yes. You know why? Yeah. People worry. Yes. This is human nature. Okay. Okay. This may not be God's nature. Yes. See, we, we need to know. Yes. Heaven and earth is interlinked and interconnected. Okay. Yeah. Heaven and earth yes. is interlinked and interconnected. Yeah. What happens in heaven, yes. it happens. Yes. That's why Jesus, people didn't know. Yeah. What, why Jesus came? Yeah. Jesus came to reveal yes. something that people need to know. Yeah. So he always tells the human beings, because human beings are always worried. Yes. That's why he tells, do not worry. Yeah. Thank you. Very well said. Let's look at the context in what Jesus is saying. In fact, he said, do not worry for what? What to eat? What to drink? What to wear? Why? The answer is given clearly for your father already knows about you. That is the focus. Now, as, as you have said very well, that every human being has to worry. For us to sustain life, to go through life, we all need to think about what's going to happen. But here in this context of what we are looking at is what Jesus is saying is, there is someone who's worrying about you. Someone who is thinking. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. You are a medical doctor. Yes. Don't you worry? Yes. Do you worry? Yes. You are a medical doctor. Yes. Don't you worry? That's exactly what I'm saying. Is that don't we plan, don't we think. It is essential to life. But if we forget the context in which we are living, that is when we begin to worry. And that is when we think that we need to solve the problem. We need to look at who the focus is. The focus is who? Not us, not our problems, but God in heaven who thinks about us. We all are, you know, parents, for example. When we have children, don't we think and plan about them? And that's what Jesus is turning our attention to, to our Heavenly Father and saying that there is a God above that who thinks about us. Let's go on into our lesson. Uh, our summary that we are going to look at quickly is uh, regarding the book of Job. We are going to look at the earliest book that has been written. We are going to look at God in nature, the origins. Uh, we are going to look at the cosmological argument that people give, the dilemma that people have, the theodicy, and finally we are going to come to our conclusion. Let's look at uh, from where this book of Job comes from. Where was it written? Where did Job look? Uh, Job, Job lived. Job is the first book that was written. Where did he live? We have the answer in Lamentations, the fourth chapter, and verse 21, where it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Eden, you who dwell in the land of Uz. Now, don't get confused between the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans, and the land of Uz. These are two different things. Just now the brother was telling me about the land of Ur from where Abraham comes from. It is near Mosul, that means in Iraq. Very close to that. It was a highly civilized place. So also is this land of Uz. Now you can see Edom, Israel is right there. You can see there, and uh, that is Edom. And Israel is up in the northern part. When you come to the southern part, you'll find Edom. And that's where 
Uz was located. And you can see here, this is uh, Eden. The whole area is Eden. And this is where somewhere here where uh, Uz is located. Now, when Moses, he went into exile, you know that he married one of the women from Midianite. She's a Midianite. And the father-in-law, what was the father-in-law? The father-in-law of Moses? Um, he was a priest of Midian. He was a priest of Midian. And as Moses began to interact with his father-in-law, most probably he must have got the story. Because Job lived a long time ago. And from that time, the ancestry had been carried on his story that had come through his father-in-law to Moses. And Moses, when he went and he was taking care of the sheep for 40 years during that time, he was able to write this uh, story about the book of Job. So the book of Job is the first book that had been written uh, before he even wrote the book of Genesis. This is very important for us. Now let's look at uh, uh, how we understand the importance of these books that are written. Genesis gives us the beginning, the origin, when everything was beautiful, when everything was lovely in its creation, and how sin originated. We also know about the conflict that took place and how mankind had surrendered his uh, privilege and prerogative of being God's son and the ruler of this earth. Now when you come to the book of Job, we look at the question, why there is suffering in this world? And then you go to the book of Revelation, when you come to the end, it shows us how sin and suffering is going to come to their logical end. And so you can see that these books are very important. So the beginning of sin, Revelation ends with the end of sin. We look at the book of Job, why there is suffering, and we look at Revelation of how the suffering is going to come to its end. Now, when we answer, when we look at this uh, question about suffering, many people actually have gone away from God because of this, on this very question, why there is suffering in this world. One such brilliant person is Charles Darwin. I want you to just look at the quotation that uh, he puts in. He says that there is much suffering in the world, no one disputes. A being so powerful, so full of knowledge as God, who could create the universe, is to our finite minds omnipotent and omniscient, and it rewards our understanding to suppose that his benevolence is not unbounded. For what advantage can there be in the suffering of millions of lower animals throughout almost endless time? You know, Darwin had come from, he is, he is the son of a minister. In fact, that Darwin himself had done theology. And Darwin was supposed to go, you know, to become a minister. And suddenly, as he started looking at this suffering, he began to question God. And he said, how is it that God is allowing so much suffering, not only in human beings, but also when you look at the world, the creality that, that is present. You'll find an innocent lamb devoured by uh, a lion um, or a tiger that comes along. And so he begins to question this, that if there is such a powerful God, why is there so much suffering? And you know the answer? He, gave, he himself gives the answer. Let's look at the next quotation. He says, if all the individuals of any species were to habitually suffer to an extreme degree, they would neglect to propagate their kind. But we have no reason to believe that this has ever or at least often occurred. Some other considerations, moreover, lead to the belief that all sentient beings have been formed as to enjoy, as a general rule, happiness. He himself contradicts himself. He says, if everyone suffers, what will happen? Survival of the fittest, everything is going to die and perish, 
And so how is going to the propagation take, going to take place? And he says, no. I think the last statement, he ends it by saying that we all have been formed to enjoy as a general rule happiness. That means in spite of this suffering, we find the images of God that, is, that has been given to us. So let's ask this, you know, there's another atheist, David Hume, his challenge. He says, is he willing to prevent evil, but not evil? Then that means he must be important. If God is not able to prevent evil, he must be important. Is he able but not willing? Then he must be benevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then the question is, why is there evil? In other words, if we look at people who don't believe in God, we should ask a very reasonable question. Is that, why should they question why there is suffering? Because in the theory of evolution, you'll find that everything happens by by chance, it all, it is randomized, you know, anything can happen at any time. So why should they question why there is suffering? It's only because we are rational beings that we would begin to understand. Let's find an answer. What are we? How can sin arise in a perfect being in a perfect place? We know that sin originated with the, uh, with the most beautiful being called Lucifer. The question, which is very valid for all of us, is, how can sin arise in a perfect being, in a perfect place? Next question. Is God responsible for creation where evil would definitely exist, where only the possibility of evil would exist? The next question. Is God unable or unwilling or both to prevent evil? Are there reasonable questions? Are these reasonable questions? Yes, sir. What would you answer? So in, in other words, what you're saying is that what has been given to us when we are not content with what, what has been given to us and we begin to experiment on what has been given to us, 
That is very easy to repair. Is that what so you say? Contentment and experiment yes. are two different things. Okay. I can be content with this. Yes. But then I can say, oh, you know, somebody else has a better spark than this. Yeah. Can I find a way to steal that spark? So you're not content when you make comparison and you see that somebody has something better. You wanted to say something? Life yeah. is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. I have life. Yeah. You have life. Yes. It is not easy. Mm -hmm. God has given to you a God. Yes. There are many who have come, mm -hmm. have passed away. You yeah. Know that. Yes. I want to explain. Life is a gift from God. Mm -hmm. We are given an opportunity to live in this world. Yes. Yeah, are, are we always looking at the evil, the mm -hmm. darkness? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at the light? Mm -hmm. God has given an opportunity for me to teach, yes. for me to be, yes. to be an example. Yeah. Okay? And then the question that we ask is, how is it that we we should not or we would not think about evil when it is present all around us? Why do we just think about evil all the time? It, even if you think about it some of the time. Brother, you have an answer? An answer, no. Yes. But, uh, but Evil is not an accident. Mm -hmm. uh, wrong is, is not an accident. Yes. Uh, and all things are created by God. Okay. He, he, he made it possible for us to be evil. Yeah. Uh, and to be wrong. Okay. And I think, uh, I think you're bringing out an important question. You said he made it possible. That means you're bringing the power of choice. You can choose if you want to be good or evil. Go ahead. Yes, he made that possible. And yes. And we do have that freedom of choice. Yes. And, and, and if I were to speculate about mm -hmm. the reasons for it, yes. it is to, to live in this world mm -hmm. with the ability to make right and wrong choices. Yes. To grow from them and prepare ourselves for heaven. Okay. So let, let's uh, kind of bring this together. Is that when we look at suffering, you just brought out the point that there is somebody who is allowing this suffering to happen. Because if God is so powerful, so great, why is he why doesn't he put an end to the suffering? And so we begin by asking in our uh, lesson study, he talks about knowing about God. The first thing is to understand about God. Now, what are the sources? If I am not a Christian, do I have a source where I can know about God? Yes. Absolutely. Where do I know? How do I know about God? That's what it is written in the book of Romans, the first chapter, if you read from you know the beginning, but looking at verse 18 onwards, what does it say? Nature itself exactly. tells you yes. that you are incapable yeah. of making nature yes. in an alternate form. Okay. You cannot do that. Yes. It's not possible. Okay. Just as you mm -hmm. cannot die yeah. and raise yourself up. Yes. It's not possible. That is true. Not because, not because you may not have that power. Mm -hmm. You don't have that power. Okay. Is it? Yes. Now, you know, patriarchal practice is, is beautiful when, when it, it talks about why was sin permitted. Okay. It says, in great mercy, mm -hmm. in God's great mercy. Yeah. Now, we are not talking of Lucifer's creation. Mm -hmm. That's a completely different subject. Yeah. Which happened, we don't know how many trillions and trillions and trillions of years. We have no idea when that was done. Yeah. So, God go along with Lucifer. But the spirit of discontent was mysterious. That's exactly what we are trying oh, to say. That, yeah. Even although God understands, mm -hmm. God has not given us that mysterious knowledge yeah. to understand. Yes. No, we don't have it. That is why. If yeah. I say I believe in God, mm -hmm. It is, it is a better alternative mm -hmm. than believing in somebody who says, uh, you know, God is interesting. Yes. You know, 
maybe we can have something more interesting than that. Yeah. So you brought up the, the, the answer by saying that we understand God through nature. Just like how everything that is made, for example, I'm holding this uh, pointer here, does it have a designer? Is it made according to a certain design? Mm -hmm. Yes. If that is true, then when we look at our human body, the more we look into the, the, the microorganisms and the micromanagement that takes place in our body, the more scientists are baffled. How is it that this design can exist precisely exactly the same way, you know, as it keeps prop propagating itself? You know how many mistakes should take place in the chromosomal level for a child or a fetus when it's being formed to be dead? How many mistakes? One. Just one. Just one. Just one mistake. One how is it that, that's the reason why in Psalms 139, what David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, there's a designer, you know, uh, that is controlling the whole thing. Let's look at Job 33rd chapter and verse 4. It says, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty is my life. It is God that has made us. Let's look at another text in Job, the 12th chapter, verse 7 to 10. It says, But now ask the beasts, they will teach you. The birds of the air, they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, it will teach you. And the fish of the sea, it will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord had done this? In other words, we are without excuse. That's what Paul says. Is that when you look at nature, you are without excuse because when you look at the amazing, you know, cosmological uh, events that take place without clashing against each other, we must come to the conclusion that there is a designer. Can I agree with you? Yes. The question of knowledge. Yeah. If the tree wasn't there, okay, the bird will worry. Mm -hmm. Because the tree is house for the bird. Yeah. Isn't that interesting why God made a tree? Mm -hmm. The tree gives shade, it gives you oxygen. Yeah. It has multiple benefits mm -hmm. that it gives to a human being yeah. or, and to the creature. Uh, so when God says not to worry, yeah. what he's saying is look. If I am sustaining the universe, mm -hmm. if I am giving you water to drink, yeah. to begin with, yes. which is life itself mm -hmm. for your body, mm -hmm. then guess what? Yeah. Don't worry. Exactly. The worry, I don't know, the word worry in original Hebrew and Arabic must, has to mean much more deeper yeah. than the English word worry. English has been, English has come, I don't know where. So let, let me expand on what you have just said. Let's look at the creation week, six days week. Which was the first one that God made? The animate or the inanimate? Pardon? The animate, the living or the non-living? The non-living. He created the environment for the living to live in. Isn't it? Just now you said about the tree. Yeah. Plants have life. That's what I'm saying. When did the plants come? They came before God created a human being. Yeah. So in the sequence of life or sequence of creation that God had made, first he made the inanimate things. Mm -hmm. That should sustain the life when it comes along. So that if you see the order, the plants come first before the birds come. Because the birds have to be there. The same way you'll find that the trees were made before man was made because he needs to be sustained by the food. So the environment, the house, the environment was created by God before he could make the man, man the most intelligent being. So that makes us understand when Jesus says, don't worry, who was the one who designed all this? It's God. If God could so plan so wonderfully, so meticulously to sustain life, God, Jesus is saying, you don't have to worry. One of the most beautiful examples actually in nature is yes. the sunflower. Okay. The sunflower, they have been unable to explain until today all the botanists, 
whoever they are. Yeah. They cannot explain how the sunflower turns the yes. sun yes. and turns its face mm -hmm. and in the evening puts its head down. Yeah. <laughs> how does it happen? And so exactly what we are saying is that when you look at these marvels, the miracles, we need to turn our attention to God. But, you know, let's look at uh, Professor Paul Davis, a British astronomer. This is what he says. He's an evolutionist. Now, this is what he says. He says the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allows something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle transcending physical principles. In other words, what they're trying to say, even the greatest science scientist, Hawkins, you know, he says, because there is gravity, everything takes place. How does everything take place? By random chance. And that is what we find as a cosmological argument. It is basically the idea that, you know, something came from something. Now, if you keep tracing the whole thing from where it has come, you'll come to an end and then say, now from where did that come from? Where did gravity come from? How is it that gravity is so organized to see that it sustains life? And so, there is no reason why we as human reasonable beings should believe in the theory of evolution. Yes? Instantaneous suspension yeah. of, and we know the physical, yeah. and laws. That is exactly what Lucifer thought mm -hmm. and said. Instantaneous suspension mm -hmm. of God's love and mercy and law. Yeah. Mysterious, absolutely. Yes. Now, let me give you a little bit of uh, calculations that are given here. This is called as the anthropic principle for to sustain life. You know, if you see the ratio of mass, electron, protons, the maximum, I should say, deviation that you can have is all in decimals. You know, it's the maximum deviation. If you deviate from this, what will happen? These protons and the electrons and all, they don't exist. If you look at the gravitational force, if the deviation goes beyond that, 1 is to 10 into 40, you know, to the power of 40, what will happen? The gravity doesn't exist. So also mass, the density, the cosmological constant. If you see that all these things are so finely tuned that any deviation will not allow life to exist. So the question that comes is, why then there is suffering? And in case there is suffering, who is allowing this suffering to take place? Let's go to the book of Job, the first chapter, uh, and let's look at the hedges that God has put within Job. Now let me ask you a question, is that could Satan on his own bring about suffering on Job? Could Satan do that? Satan on his own, could he bring suffering upon Job? He did not have the capacity. He did not have the power to do it. He needed yeah. a permission. God has to allow that. God has to allow that. So let's look at the three hedges that we have. The first hedge, we are all here. The first hedge is the positions that we have, the profession that we are in. That's the hedge that we have, the positions the money that we have, that's a hedge that God has put within us. What's the next hedge? As you penetrate deeper, it is our family. Our family is a hedge for us. So that we can understand God's love and uh, you know, uh, remain and propagate. So family is the next hedge. What's the third one? It is our Saddam So in the first permission, what did Satan ask? What happened? God said, go ahead. So he gives permission and, and allows Satan to penetrate these two hedges. What are those? What happened to Job? The first thing that happened to Job? His property was destroyed. And what's the next thing that happened? His family was destroyed. And then God calls uh, Satan again and says, did you see my servant Job? He still keeps his firm trust in God. And he says, skin for skin. You know, you touch him on in his body and then he will curse you. Do we have any modern examples of Job in the world? 
in the world where they suffer and still remain true to God? Possession is gone, family is gone, health is gone. Yes, and how they remain true? I'm just going to conclude with the, you know, answering that very quickly. We need to understand that for Satan to come to this level, for those who are under the protection of God, it requires these permissions. But if we choose to move away from that circle that God has drawn and go over to Satan's side, he has absolute power to destroy us whenever he wants. We need to understand that. Now, my, my, my issue is, yes, within, the, within, within Christianity, yes, do we have any modern examples? I don't really see any. Okay. It, it is, this is the most extreme human condition. Suffering? That, no, that Joe went through? No, we are talking suffering. Uh -huh. It's the most extreme human condition uh -huh. you can find yourself in. Okay. Uh, let me give you, let me give you a human example. Yeah. In 1905, no, between 1905 and 1906, mm -hmm. when the Turks were fighting against uh, the Russians, mm -hmm. all the soldiers had was what they wore. Mm -hmm. They had no shoes. Mm -hmm. And it was snowing. Mm -hmm. They still won the war. Okay. They won. Mm -hmm. Many of them died. Mm -hmm. It was extreme human condition. Uh, I'm just giving an example. So the, the, the intent is, Job had a mind mm -hmm. when he said, I have a mind, I can think what happened. Mm -hmm. I know this is bad, but what can I say? I can't say much about it. Mm -hmm. the, the Lord gave the Lord takes it away. Okay. Let's ask this question. Is pain essential? Is suffering essential? Absolutely not. Let's it is not to be essential. Now, uh, let's look at a, a condition. You know, I'm a medical person. So let's look at a condition called as CIPA, C-I-P-A, which is, stands for congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. That means a person is born completely free of pain. You touch, you do anything, they don't sense the pain. You think that's a blessing? No, in human condition it's not. It is not a blessing. You know what the mother says? Statement by mother, her mother, she says, I pray to God every night for my daughter that God would give her a sense of pain every night. You know why? When she touches the hot stove, she doesn't know it has blood. Every night the mother had to examine from head to toe to see if she has bruised herself or hurt herself. Every day is a challenge for the mother. When she goes out and plays, when she does something, when she lights the fire, when she tries to cook or do anything to be normal. And therefore she says, every night I pray, God, give her pain. But you still have an interesting question. Yes. Pain. And so, let me put it this way. You know, one of the greatest apologists, he says, the pain of pain clasps the life-saving hand of God and draws us into God's arms. In other words, we understand that sin is an aberration, suffering is an aberration, that is not the design of God. But the wonderful thing that we need to understand as we conclude is that God uses that very same thing that is called as pain to bring out the best. Let's look at that quickly. Our time is running short. Uh, you know, there's a new term that is in, in introduced. It's called as theodicy. Theodicy is nothing but where you begin to understand the relevance of God's goodness amidst the pain that, that is surrounding us. In other words, we begin to question why, if God is so powerful, why is there suffering? Theodicy is where, where we begin to understand that God is able to bring out the very best from the worst of circumstances. Let's look at how temptations, trials, and uh, you know difficulties come to us quickly. You know there are four reasons why we get have these trials. Uh, number one, it is because we are living in a world of sin, in a sinful environment. The next one, it is because of a result of our own foolish actions. For example, it could be sickness, that is planned destruction, terrorism, ISIS, and all that, blackmail, difficulties, abuse, corruption, all these things we find examples in the Bible as a result of uh, uh, the actions of others. 
The next one is Satan bringing in temptations and trials. We have great exceptions that is found in the Bible. Job, Jesus, Paul, Joseph, all these people, uh, you know, were he allowed that particular temptations and trials to come to them. Uh, and Satan was permitted to bring in trials, particularly to these people. And finally, we find that God testing his own people. You know, we find examples like Abraham, Moses, Hezekiah, God particularly test them. Uh, in, you know, and in sending trials to these people. Now we usually grapple with the circumstances here in this area. The temptations that come to us. Uh, let me ask another question. You think money is a temptation? Why not? You think uh, people suffer because they have much? Yeah. yeah. We don't understand. You know, sometimes we think that being affluent is not a temptation and a trial. Affluence is a trial that uh, comes to us. Popularity, what about popularity? Yeah, that's a temptation. Why is the money? Uh, let's, let's make a uh, let clarification. The use of money. Oh, whatever. Okay, you put it that way. The things you do for money. Yeah, the things you do for money. Uh, so we have affluent temptations. We have other things like poverty, humiliation. We all understand that. Health-related sickness, natural calamities, all these things bring in suffering to us. Let's wrap this up by trying to understand why if God is so powerful, does he allow sickness, trials, and suffering that comes to us? Before that, let's look at what is Satan's plan in this world when we face trials and temptations. Now, the suffering and pain that Satan brings to us, he wants us to get into discouragement. And through discouragement, you know, he wants to increase that so that we can start rebelling against God. That's, that's the test that Job had. Why men come and say, curse God and die? Rebel against him. And because of his rebellion, he is now waiting for God to punish this rebel. And then God would be blamed for all the suffering that comes to us. This is the plan, the ploy. Of Satan. How do we get out of it? Now let's try to understand what is God's eternal design in this whole drama or in this whole world that we go through suffering. Temptations and trials that come to us. God's design is it should lead us to humble oneself. That should lead to death to self. This causes suffering. This causes suffering. Now this suffering should lead us to strengthen our faith through patience, which will give us inner strength, which will lead us to become perfect, cleansed from earthly drops, leading to perfection, which gives us a fitness for heaven. This is God's formula for each one of us, why we have our suffering. And if you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, if you read from verse 30 onwards, what does it say? There had no temptation come to man that is beyond our ability to bear it. But God, with the temptation, brings in a way of escape. So we, we need to understand the essentiality of suffering, that in spite of suffering, who is there with us? Who is there with us? God is with us. Let's look at quickly a text that is found in the book of Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, and let's read from verse uh, 1 onwards. Amazing text. Uh, and then we'll try to conclude our lesson study today. It says here, O Israel, the one who formed you, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Now look, look at the next verse. When you go through deep waters, what's the next day? Yeah, Isaiah 43. Yeah, verse 1 on verse I'm reading now, I'm in verse 2. It says, when you go through deep waters, what will happen? I will be with you. The next one. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not be drowned. When you walk through fire and oppression, you will not be burned. The amazing thing, what God says is, it's not that you're not going to go through fire. It's not that you're not going to go through water. It's not that you're not going to go through difficulties. But what will happen? I will be there with you. And that is God's design. You know, if we are able to receive God's strength and help, which is combined in our weakness, 
That is all. We lead us to perfection. You want to say something? Yes. I appreciate your good lesson study. You, you designed it. The whole book of Job, 42 chapters. Yes. Satan challenging God. Yeah. It's a challenge. Yes. To say that we become Job. Yeah. Job is going to curse him. That's his challenge. Yes. That was his formula. Yeah. So then he took the wife. Mm -hmm. The wife says, why don't we curse God and die? Yeah. That's his main challenge, main focus. Mm -hmm. And he wants to confuse Job, confuse the world, confuse yes. you and me. Yeah. That is Jason's device. Yes. But God's choice is this devil. So it says, curse God and die. Yes. Wife said it well, very well. Curse God and die. Mm -hmm. But praise God and be. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the lesson that we can learn, many times, you know, the question brother asked is, is there someone who suffers like Job today and come out triumphant? I want to bring you a, a, a story, a real event that took place in my hospital. A girl by the name of Supraja. She's only 20 years old. Her parents gave her in marriage when she was almost 18 years or probably 16 years. She has two lovely daughters, two kids, very young. She has this disease called as SLE. It's a lupus disease, autoimmune disease. That is autoimmune lupus, SLE. Systemic lupus erythematosus. It's a very rare disease. Among the lupus, it is the worst type. Where the blood circulation to different organs as, uh, because of this condition autoimmune, the body fights it and it gains itself. The blood circulation begins to stop and slowly she starts developing necrosis. She's only 20 years old when she came to our hospital with the whole body like a charcoal. You know, her whole skin was blackened with, uh, you know, necros tissue, gangrenous tissue. We literally have to remove it like a cadaver. You can see her body right here. You can see wounds everywhere. You know, her legs, her back. So the way we needed to treat her was, first is we flip her over to the back side, clean up the whole area, and then flip her over to the front side and clean up that area and dress her wounds. She was going through excruciating pain. One morning when I went for hours, or in, in one, one night, they gave me a call and said that she attempted suicide. She took all the medications that were given to her, popped it in her body. She didn't want to live anymore. Her in-laws had separated her from her children. She could not see them. It's not only a physical torture that she was going through, it was a mental agony that she was going through. And you can, you can, you know, smell the stink almost from, you know, three, four, uh, rooms before you could actually enter into her. Such situations she was existing. Mm -hmm. Somehow we shifted her into the ICU. We, you know, washed her, brought her everything, and then she was stabilized. We brought her back. Every day I would talk to her and tell her, "We are in a war. We are in the battlefield." In this war, you must win. The only way you can win this war, because what Satan wants to do is exactly this. He wants to disgrace you, see that you curse God and die. But you can be a victor in this. And so we will go with her, we will pray with her, we will read the verses. Every day I will tell her to memorize and keep a scripture in our heart. The following day when I came, you know what she was doing? She started singing when I was pressing those boots. What did she do? She was singing when I was pressing the boots. Amazing. 
Tears were flowing in my eyes because I was beginning to think, if I was in her condition, just 20 years old, just 20 years old, would I say, <coughs> and it's me. <clears throat> Many days passed by. Uh, you know, we decided that we are going to shift her to another uh, hospital, bigger hospital. We tried to make all the arrangements. That morning I went and talked to her, read from the Bible. And I said, you know, more than I can treat you, you are treating me. You have been a lesson book for me. Because you have taught us how to become a victor in life. Amidst all the suffering, amidst all the agony, amidst all the isolation, amidst all this stink that is there, you have taught me how to praise God. Just I finished rounds when I went down. We prayed is that she became serious. We shipped her to the ICU. Very soon, she rested in Jesus Christ. A triumphant life. What more can you ask? What more can you ask? You know, we all gathered, you know, all the staff came together afterwards and they said, what can we learn from this? More than what we can give, she has given back to us an example of a triumphant life in Jesus Christ. You can't expect more than this. Is there someone who can live like Job? Yes. We have examples of many people. And for me it's a challenge. That as I go through life, that I rivet my eyes upon Jesus Christ. And to know that we can go through life knowing that there is someone above. I want to close with uh, saying this. Uh, the summary is Jesus never promised followers a trouble-free life in this world. Quite the opposite. But he promised that he would supply all our needs if we put him and his kingdom first. You know, what I would like to say in conclusion is this. Whenever we go through suffering, just ask one single question. Go to Calvary and ask if you're suffering more than that. Anytime, anytime that we go through, go to Gethsemane and ask the question. Are we suffering more than that? If not, look at Jesus who will be our example. Just as I close, I thought that uh, I will teach you a, a simple song. This is the Job song. It's called Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. And uh, it's a, it has a simple tune I want to sing for you. And uh, I want you to join. I'll sing with you the first part, the first uh, chorus. And then you can uh, sing along with me. As we sing this song, uh, we can turn our Bibles to uh, Job, the first chapter, verse 21. Job 121. You know, one of the things that we are doing in our place is to use the Bible as a songbook and learn to scream, sing the scripture songs. And so, uh, this will help us when we go to Job, the first chapter, verse 21, and uh, we go to Job, the 13th chapter, and verse 15. It's a simple word, and I will sing for you. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. 